The dangerous alcoholic spiral. How does it work? When do we get to the point of no return? Is there a point of no return? Today, we're going to talk about this spiral that takes you from your first drink of alcohol, eventually, if you're destined to become an alcoholic, as I was and Terry was, into a spiral out of control and ultimately almost the end. And so we need to understand exactly what's going on because some people were not so fortunate. Some people do meet a tragic end when it comes to this spiral. We want to talk about what it was like to be in that spiral, how we couldn't see our way out of that spiral, even if someone came along and said, hey, you're in a spiral, we'd say, what spiral? Give me another drink, I'm fine. And today we want to go through this and really hash out what it means to feel the way that you feel and what it means to get out of that what it's like when the fog lifts and the drink goes away and you start to see life for what it is. It's actually a good thing. And so we're going to go through this stuff and start to understand how the alcoholic spiral works. We're going to talk about the Jelinek curve. We're going to talk about how to get out of the spiral. We're going to talk about chemical dependency. And more importantly, we're going to talk about you and how you might be feeling and how the feelings of hopelessness might be clouding your judgment to actually get sober. So, Terry, how you doing today? I'm doing well. I'm way beyond that spiral. I've come out of it. So, yeah. Um, I could, you know, let me tell you a little story about, about my spiral mm -hmm. out of control with alcohol. Um, years ago, well, I've, I've been a cyclist for many decades and I wrote right on the road, and, and um, I have been a member of cycling groups. I've done many organized rides, and um, even when alcohol was a problem, I continued to cycle, uh, pure insanity. And here, the, this one time I was going to um, do this organized ride, and it was going to be a 100-mile ride. I trained for it, trained while I was drinking. Terrible thing. Never do that. It is very dangerous. And I did that. And then I went to this organized ride, and when I got there, um, I hadn't had anything to drink that day. I was shaking because I was towards the bottom of that spiral. Alcohol had, was ruling my life at that point. I needed alcohol. And I went, I went to start this ride, and my shakes were so bad, the handlebars were just shaking back and forth. I went about two, three miles with the group I was riding with. Nobody noticed anything. This is the insanity of it. What did I do? I, st I told them, you know what? There's something wrong with my bike. I'm going to go back and have the mechanic look at it because there's a mechanic at the beginning of these rides. And so I went back to my truck, put alcohol in there, and I drank and I did the ride. And that is pure insanity. I was getting towards the bottom of that spiral, that dangerous alcoholic spiral. It was pure insanity. Never do this. It's it's a terrible thing to do. And, you know, I was actually not at the bottom of my spiral. I continued to go down further and further. This is the insanity of this disease. This is the danger of this disease. And it's important to be able to recognize it and um, figure out what to do, like get some help. Absolutely. And I remember uh, I was talking to some family members a couple weeks ago. And you know how everyone in the family is an expert on everything. Like they all, they all have these hidden PhDs where they know everything. Um, and really it's like, no, you just watch too much TV. That's really all it is. And they were schooling uh, everyone on addiction. And I'm like, okay, well, this, this happens to be a topic I'm a little passionate about. You know, it's something I, I, I've read at least a book about. And they were talking about how, you know, the addict does these things because they're degenerate and that's just it. They're just bad. Like Terry went and rode his bike with vodka instead of water in his water bottle, shaking like a leaf, probably could have gone off a mountain. If you've ever been in California, there's like mountains with no border. Yeah. Like, like when we were driving up to Tahoe, it's like, wow, I could just like not be on the road anymore. And I'd be, you know, 5,000 feet down or whatever it is. And they look at it like we're degenerates. Now, do we do de degenerative things? Yeah, we do. Guilty as charged. But I think the motive behind them and understanding what's going on is the key. Did Terry wake up one day and be like, I'm a badass, I'm going to drink vodka on the bike? No. He woke up and had the shakes and he's like, the only way I know how to function and live 
in this world, in my skin, in my mind, is drinking. That's the thing. And we start to look at that, and here's me, a complete and utter germaphobe. I don't like germs. I can't stand them. Sometimes I'll sit there and I'll be like, I touched this thing which could have possibly touched this other thing, but even though it was sterilized, I know in my brain it probably wasn't. And it's insanity. But that's the kind of person I am when I'm sober. When I drink, I'm going through the garbage bin to get the, the little bits of drink that were left in the things I had. And not like the garbage bin in our house. No, no, I, I, like, I, I'd like to think I was better than George Costanza getting the donut out of the top of the trash, but no, I was in the bin that was ready to go uh, to the truck. And why? Why was I like that? Am I, am I secretly just a degenerate who likes germs? Or did chemical dependency take over? Right, and I think it's very important to look at this because people don't talk about chemical dependency enough. Terry, on his bike ride, was not a degenerate. He wasn't a bad cyclist. He wasn't trying to have performance-enhancing stuff because alcohol does not performance-enhance no. anything. Um, you know, and, and we start to look at that, and it's like, wait a minute. Terry was in the grip of the alcoholic spiral. And he felt like there was nothing but drinking that would help him. And you know what? With the limited knowledge he had, with the limited knowledge I had, that was true. It was true. The only thing I knew that would help me was drinking more. That's it. Yeah. I didn't know another way. Someone came along and said, hey, there's another way. And I was like, you're full of it. You have no idea. Right? And... I think it's important to look at and understand that this spiral goes deeper than you would think, right? It might be, oh, hey, this guy's drinking a little bit too much. Yay, wonderful, great, he's funny. But there might be more going on. Actually, it's funny, when I went into rehab, everyone but my dad was shocked. My dad was like, yeah, I knew you were an alcoholic, probably because he grew up with an alcoholic mom and he had seen the signs throughout his entire life. Um, but nobody knew. They thought, I just like to drink. Right? And, it, and it's interesting to look at because I think our society doesn't talk about this enough. But Terry, what do you think about that spiral and, and where you were and how it felt? Well, for, for me, it took kind of a really long time to get there. You know, I started off that, that first stage... You know, and I mean, I started had my first drink when I was very, very young, but um, had the high school fun times, the college fun times, the fun times after college, and alcohol was uh, did not rule my life. That that first stage was just enjoying it, and I got relief out of it. You know, it would help me go to sleep. It would help me relax after a hard day of work. It would help me celebrate. And, and things like that. It was Alcohol was a good thing. It was an answer for me. Um, I've talked to some people that are in recovery, and, and they have, they've had their, like, you know, when they had their first drink, they knew it was the answer to all of their problems. And instantly they were, you know, drinking large quantities and binge drinking, whatever they were doing. For me, it wasn't really that way. I was kind of a heavy drinker, if you were to ask the medical um, community, yeah, I was a heavy drinker, but but um, that was kind of the first way it was for quite a while, like many many years, and then it started to get worse. I started to want it more, and it was first started with wanting it more, and so I would go ahead and drink more, and then it would become more of a I needed more, I need the drink after that last that hard day of work, or I need the drink to celebrate. I need the drink to go do this, to go do that. And that, that was becoming the next stage. And that's, that, that's sort of how that spiral was starting to really take form. And as I needed it more and more, I would start to realize that, hey, this might be causing some problem. Maybe I have a problem here, but then I wouldn't want to face it. I didn't, I didn't know how to face the problem. I didn't know that I needed to quit. I thought I could just cut back. So then I start to try to cut back. But then I crave it more. 
it's this spiral. It just goes around and around. And I drink more because I felt bad because I couldn't quit. So I just want to push that feeling away. And it would get worse and worse until eventually it was a, a really bad situation. And uh, had, I had, had to have the medical detox. And I had to get help because I did not have the knowledge on how to quit. I needed help. Yeah. And I think that's where a lot of people have the trouble is, is they get on this spiral and they don't know exactly where to go. I mean, people have heard of the, all the 12 step programs and there's other things and they go to doctors or psychiatrists and things like that, but they don't fully dive in. It's, I think one of the most difficult things when you're quitting drinking is realizing that you can't drink anything and you have to get through that detox. And it's a, dangerous things so you have to go to a doctor to get through that detox it's tough it's a difficult thing to get through but that's kind of kind of how that spiral worked for me and um like marcus like marcus um people didn't realize i don't think anybody really realized the extent of my drinking because i think uh this us alcoholics are professional liars hiders we we hide it really well and, uh, you know, sometimes we make a mistake and get caught. And, but uh, a lot of us are able to hide it for our entire drinking career. And that was me. People were really surprised when I finally had to go to rehab. Absolutely. And it's interesting, too, because, you know, I, I was kind of off and on. Like, I remember the help that alcohol was for me. Like, I had that experience of, like, wow, where has this been my entire life? Uh, but I also just like to drink. And I think that in the beginning I used it as, you know, just to relax and um, shut off the, the voice in my head that told me I couldn't do things and things like that. And I think it's interesting because, as Terry said, you know, it took him a while. And sorry, Terry, I'm going to cover up your... Your picture here to show the Jelinek curve thing. Oh, yeah. Um, this is from the Hazelden uh, Betty Ford uh, site. And they talk about this Jelinek curve, which I think is pretty popular uh, everywhere. And the idea behind the curve is that, you know, you're going to start out occasional relief drinking, um, unable to uh, discuss the problem, feelings of guilt, memory blackouts increase. Uh, neglect of food, work and money troubles. And what happens is all these things start to get bigger. And a lot of people, you know, they want to know what the definition of an alcoholic is so they can figure out if they are one. And the definition is continuing to drink despite negative consequences in your life. Right? So when we look at this, we're like, okay, um, delusion while drinking, uh, fear, impaired thinking, Onset of lengthy intoxications, moral deterioration, physical deterioration, tremors and early morning drinks, neglect of food, legal trouble. We look at all this and it's like, okay, well, you know, if I was, uh, you know, watching too much TV and I got legal trouble and I got this and I got that because I was watching TV, I'd probably stop watching TV. It'd be pretty easy. It would be like, yeah, okay, that's the problem, clearly. Now, alcohol is a little different because it tells you that it's not the problem. And we fight it. And we say, no, this is not it. And the reason is because of chemical dependency. And that's when you get down into the spiral, down in the bottom, where it just keeps going. Keeps going. Now, out of here, it says, okay, you got to have an honest desire for help. Yes and no. Did I have an honest desire? I, I did want help. But, like, that came from, wow, you're in a mental institute and you're losing everything dear to you. I mean, it wasn't like I woke up one day like a Billy Madison and he's like, yes, I will go back to school. No, that's not how it was. I right. literally had to be forced into it. Like, yeah, I, couldn't I, see I absolutely way. didn't want help, but I knew deep down I needed help. That was kind of my attitude. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, uh, you know, like if you could have snapped your fingers and said, hey, you could keep drinking and we'll take away a couple of the bad things that are happening in your life, I would have kept drinking. Like I would have been yeah. like, yeah, it was kind of like, how much can I tolerate? How much am I okay with? Right. Yeah. I'll, I'll lose my house, but you know, I really don't want to have this other stuff happen or legal trouble or whatever. 
Um, but it gets to the point where I could empathize with people on the road that live on the road because of alcohol. I could, I, yeah, give me an F, I'll be there. I could have been there if I didn't have uh, the group of support that I had, if I did, wasn't able to afford or get in a rehab. Yeah, I could have easily gotten there. I can see why those things happen. Um, and it's interesting the way that you, you learn it because back when I was a, a preacher, uh, there was this, this homeless guy that we'd take care of from time to time. We'd see him on and off. Like every three months we'd see him and we'd get him a hotel and help him get, uh, you know, cleaned up so he could go try to get a job. And then three months later, same thing. Like, Hey, what, what happened with the help we gave you? We even took him up to a rehab in, in Riverside. Six months after that, there he is on the road again. Why did that happen? And sometimes there are things in people's lives that are painful or difficult, or maybe they just get hooked on alcohol because alcohol is addictive. It is an addictive thing. Chemical dependency is something where you feel like you're dependent on it for life. You feel like if you don't have it, you're not going to be around, like Terry and the bike story. He couldn't go with alcohol long enough to go on his bike ride. Right. You know? Let me touch on this one question from Marcus. Um, it, and your question is, is failing not to have a drink part of the healing process? I know ideally one should not drink at all, but is failing forward part of the process? So I think what you're a asking is, do people, they stop drinking and then they then they relapse and have more drinks? If um, I think that's what you're asking. I'm going to answer that question and uh, yes, some people do um, have drinks, but many, many more when they finally make that decision to quit, they stop for good. And that that is the best thing to do. It's a very dangerous thing for to relapse. Uh, some people don't make it. Some people go back to the drink and they never make it back to sobriety. And maybe even worse things happen. So it's a dangerous thing. Ideally, we want to stop and we want to stop for good. But uh, still, it's 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 a difficult thing. So that's kind of the answer I have for your question. Yeah. Yeah, and I don't think it... I think if you put the safeguards in place when you make your resolve not to drink, I think that's what's going to help you. Right? What are you going to do to not drink? First, if you're getting sober, go to the doctor. Deal with detox. Um, if you can go to a 30-day or whatever rehab program, do it. I'm yeah. glad I did. Uh, it was a big step. I was like, how's my work going to be? How's this going to be? 30 days, a lot of money. I mean, it was a big commitment, but I had to do it. There was well, no other it, option. Even, even more than all that, the fear of not knowing what's going to happen mm -hmm. and what, you know, what's coming next in your life. That was the biggest thing for me is that fear. Yeah. And having yeah. to talk to people about serious things. I've never done that in my life. Yeah. And uh, the fear of rehab itself. Like, I was yeah. like, is this going to be like jail or, you know, and the first day kind of seemed that way. I was like, ah, oh, some interesting folks here, um, you know, and I'm like, how do they not get in brawls all the time? I mean, it's, I don't know, somehow it doesn't, it's somehow it works. Um, yeah. But I think it's interesting because would I do it again? Yeah, I'd do it again if I had to. Um and I think it's important to look at because you get to detox in a safe environment. You get to learn how to not drink. And, and more importantly, I learned emphatically alcohol was the problem. That's it. There are just, there's some other things in my life. Sure, everyone's got stuff. But alcohol was the problem. Number one, first and foremost, that was the problem. Yeah, taking alcohol, taking alcohol out of my life probably... I don't know. Could I put a percentage on the problems it took away? 85, 90% of the problems went away. Mm -hmm. I mean, a pretty good percentage. That's that's pretty good. Life got did get a lot better. It was not easy because I was still very sick when I got sober. But um, And Danny, I just wanted to say congratulations on going to a doctor. Uh, that's, that's the thing to do. But uh, yeah, life definitely got better. Yeah. Um, DMC says, does alcohol scar, scar the person's psyche even when they quit alcohol? Um, scar the psyche, 
Those are big words. I'll have to think about that a minute. Um, but yeah, we look at, does it affect your brain even when you're sober? Yes, for a time. Yeah, uh, for a time it does. That's what we call uh, dry drunk or wet brain, um, where you know your brain is still recovering. I found that most of the stuff went away about a year. I mean, the stuff that I deal with now is pretty much the stuff I've been dealing with my whole life. Um, so does it, I would say that alcohol doesn't necessarily scar your psyche. It's the way you thought and the things you did while drinking that scars you. Not necessarily the alcohol, because the good thing about chemical dependency is in like a week, it's gone. Then it's all mental. That's why this battle is so difficult, because once the chemical is out of your body, like right now, I am eight, eight and a half years alcohol free. Haven't touched it in eight and a half years. Now, once in a great while, like there was some stuff happening the other week and my brain was like, ah, you know, you could drink over this. And that was all mental. There was no chemical dependency because there's no chemical to be dependent on. However, I know that my mental state and drinking will kick up that chemical dependency right away. That's why they call it like the the lion in the corner doing push-ups waiting for you to drink or something like that um, because that's what's going to happen. And, and is it a lion? Is it a, you know, ape on your back? No, I think what it is is your body is used to chemical dependency. You're used to drinking. If I went out and drank, two drinks wouldn't be enough. I'd have to have three, four, five, or a million, and then chemical dependency would kick in because I wouldn't want to be hung over the next day. And the best way to not be hung over the next day is to keep drinking, uh, even though it's wreaking havoc on your entire body. So I think it's more or less learning not to give in to the mental craving. That's yeah. the key. Yeah, indeed. And to piggyback on what Marcus is talking about. So for, for me, I, yeah, it took about a year. Or so, and then I started. To, I was I was pretty much better, and was I am I was I and am I permanently affected by what the the alcohol that I drink? I I don't think so. But on the other side is the recovery has taught me how to live life. Before when I was drinking, my answer was alcohol. It was it, that was my answer for many things for decades. And now I know how to deal with life a lot better. Am I perfect at it? Absolutely not. But I do know how to live life and, and be reasonably happy. I know how to deal with bad situations better. And that's the key with the recovery and being sober. And that's what sobriety is for me, is, is being able to live a particularly happy life. I mean, it's not perfect. Of course not. But I know how to deal with situations. I know how to... Um, enjoy and before i didn't especially those bad situations but even the good ones i didn't know how to deal with them didn't know how to live life didn't know how to take responsibility for myself absolutely and i think you know i don't know if we talk enough about about the mental craving um i think that's an important component that people don't talk about because it's like okay well once alcohol is out of your life now what you know, and the now what is what's scary. And that's what's difficult to get through. And if I didn't have the tools that I had uh, when I was getting sober and, and learning this stuff, and luckily for me, um, when I got sober, I, I took pretty much like a year off work. I didn't do much at all that year. Um, and I started to realize, hey, wait a minute, I'm going to learn this stuff. And that's all I did. Like, I would spend five hours, six hours a day learning this stuff and three hours trying to pretend I was working. Um, so it was interesting, but that's something that we really uh, go over in our course over at TalkSober.com. You can go to TalkSober.com right here like this. This will give you all the tools, all the mental stuff. It gives you like 31 different PDFs, 31 different videos, worksheets, audios, all kinds of stuff to help you get and stay sober. And also... It supports what we're doing on the channel. So if you like this channel, you want to see us on for a long time, uh, not only will you get all kinds of cool stuff, but this will also help you out. Also, you can get a private sobriety call with Terry and myself. Um, and we've priced these like we are the lowest price of all the ones that I've found out there because 
I want to be available to people who, who don't have deep pockets that want to get sober because, you know, most of the people I've met in recovery aren't like loaded rich. So, I mean, some are and more power to you, but uh, we wanted to make this available for everyone. And so we've made um, the recovery class, I think is like less than a dollar a day. You can cancel whenever you want. You just go to TalkSober.com, click the yellow button, fill this out. You'll get instant access to all that stuff. Um, if you want to do a private sobriety call with Terry and myself, uh, you can click here. I think it's like, what is it? 97 bucks. And uh, you can have a call with us. And, um, you know, we're here to, to try to help you and help you understand what we went through, because that's what I found was there was a lack of, of understanding what people go through. Um, also on Talk Sober, we have a free Facebook group as well uh, for those that need something for free. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. And congratulations on 11, uh, 11 months DMC. That's awesome. And yeah, I drank for about the same amount of time you did 30 years. Social situations, you're still very much avoiding the ones where alcohol is involved. And, and I, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm careful with those as well. Um, I'm not saying that I completely avoid them, but when I do go to those social situations, I do try to have a plan. Like I drive myself mm -hmm. and, or, and, or drive my wife. My wife and I go together. She might have a glass of wine or something, but I'm able to leave when I want. I usually show up on time. You know, we're getting into that time of year where, where many of us have those social situations where alcohol is. And uh, we might do a, a, one of these Thursdays about that coming up. But uh, but I show up on time and I leave a little early. You can tell when you're not drinking and everybody else is. You can tell when it's time to go. It's usually, you know right after dinner or after dessert, whatever whatever that is. But that's one thing I do. And Ben has, has been mentioning throughout the chat there, um, um, staying busy. Uh, that's, you know, Marcus was uh, just a little bit ago, he's, he's talking about, you know, I'm sober, now what? And uh, Ben was mentioning, you know, he stays busy. That's what I try to do as well, is try to stay busy. I, um, I'm seven months into my new house, and I'm still super busy with it frustrating but anyways that's and you know i joined a couple groups cycling group and things like that and i'm gonna go meet some men for breakfast after this that's something i would never have done back in the day <laughs> but mm -hmm. i'm gonna go do that and uh you know that's that's a that's a good thing to do when you're sober is um activities that don't involve alcohol that you might enjoy try and figure out what you enjoy absolutely all right, so I think that kind of covers our topic today. Anything else you wanted to add or any other pressing questions, type them in the comment. I think one thing I could say about the, that, uh, the dangerous alcoholic spiral is um, we don't have to get to the bottom of it. We can stop at any time. Um, you know, the, when you start to see those signs where alcohol is starting to affect your life and you're continuing to drink, that's that's a time to step back and take a look and think, maybe, maybe I need to stop. And that's a time where you can step back. You can quit drinking right now. It's, you know, we always tell you, go see a doctor, but you can stop right now. You can start again later. It's okay. Well, maybe it's not okay, but you can stop right now and you can definitely start again but uh it's we don't have to get to that bo the bottom of the spiral we can stop absolutely and anybody can if i'm able to stop i bet any of you can absolutely but definitely go to the doctor if uh you're dealing with detox all right guys so hopefully uh that helps you out there's some other videos we have on this channel make sure you subscribe check them out about this topic uh lots of good stuff Focus on getting yourself sober, get away from the chemical dependency, get safe, go to a doctor, whatever you got to do, um, and then, you know, learn the mental aspect uh, one piece at a time. And I think it's very, very important. Um, yeah. Yeah. All right, guys. Thanks for being here. Check out 